Okie dokie. All right. And let me start not just recording, but also sharing my screen. And um, let me introduce you to the GitLab Web ID project. And then I want to walk through, because we're doing, it's kind of a monorepo approach so that we can have nice cohesive packages, which is huge maintainability win. And try to make this as easy to work with as possible. So if you do run into issues with this, we want to know that so that it's um, because so far it's profitable main, from a maintainability perspective. But if it's if anything like that changes, then we we're, we want to address it. Um, so I want to walk through. One of the things we'll walk through is the. Um, the way those packages, the responsibilities and how they're meant to depend on each other. Um, but before we do that, let me just walk into how it's set up. And uh, some of this is already in our developer guide, uh, but I have the project checked out. So I'm here at the GitLab Web ID. If I go to the README, um, this, is, has a, this whole repo has a pages deployment for the example package, which consumes our main artifact from this repo. And so you can run, you know, the main branch build gets deployed to pages. And these are like the entry point parameters that uh, kick off our main packages entry point function. Any main GitLab user isn't going to see this UI. This is all just example code. But once you hit so our GitLab this, this is like a uh, this is like what simulates the same environment in which this web ID would run in the context of the GitLab application. We're just like yep. passing those parameters, uh, but in the context of the GitLab application, it will be like whatever project that the user is opening. Yep, one hundred percent. We can uh, you'll see that over in. Uh, in it, GitLab Web ID, this is that main entry point. And so these are just, we pass, we let the user input values for these things so we can get some more immediate feedback rather than having everything all integrated uh, into the GitLab project because we don't really need to be when we're just working on the Web ID project. Um, but when this is all integrated in the main GitLab project, like this repo, um, yeah, this stuff comes from the controller. So he's, this stuff comes from that route. Uh, but on the example project, we fill in that information and we hit the start button and the thing starts up and loads our file tree and things are under development. Um, so this modal thing pops up and yeah, so we're just building out the features here. One huge, obviously missing feature is source control. So that's bit that we're um, refining. So we did the technical spike of validating that we could do this, but since then we kind of changed our um, approach to it for reliability reasons. But this this is the next thing we're building out of this in-memory source control for it. Um, but you should be able to, at the current state, uh, open files, do the fuzzy file find, um, and make whatever changes you want to make, and they'll be persisted. Yeah, so that's that's so, kind of, mm -hmm. uh, the uh, those PS codes provide uh, a built in uh, version control module. So we we, we can we, we cannot use that one, or is it that it doesn't provide it? Uh, um, uh, I'll be able to it it does have one, but it's meant to interface with Git through the terminal, and so we this is a completely unconnected environment. When we do, um, so let me go back to opening up the um, example. So big state of projects. So stepping way back. Um, from the user perspective, we want to support this very free, unconnected, 
client only web ID, but let's try to use VS Code's UI. Uh, <clears throat> so that's what VS Code.dev does. But what they've done is they've created an in memory file system and their own version of like this in memory source control thing. And that's what we're working on is our version of the in memory file system and our in memory source control thing. But when we do remote development, where I'm actually going to go connect connect to a VS Code server running somewhere, I can use the UI. This web base is like a client to that VS Code server, and that can actually run extensions that use Git or whatever other kind of backend service that's needed. So that's where, um, from architecture perspective, we'll probably use extensions of like having this client only extension set that uses things more in memory and in the browser. And a lot of those will be unplugged when we want to do like connect to the remote development environment. And so this is a different entry point function if we want to do this. And um, that's very related to the main issue that we want to try to get done this milestone. Um, so when you are talking about remote development, you are not talking um, VS Code Server. You are not talking about the same remote development project that the other part of our team is working on. Because when I, I don't, I, I'm not like completely up to date with that, but they are talking about a different runtime uh, that is not VS Code Server, right? It is. It will be VS Code Server running in the remote development infrastructure which they are developing oh okay okay yeah right. yes there's an infrastructure that's orchestrating things but the vs code server is kind of the controller for this client to hit that box that was orchestrated for this instance and so i yeah vs code server is still an integral part with the remote development offering. Oh. But and what we're still iterating on is like what that infrastructure will look like. Like, will we use Shea to, you know, spin up these containers and remote file systems and stuff? Or will we, you know, roll our own something based on Kubernetes or what? That's what we're, yeah. we're still trying to decide. <clears throat> okay. So like Eclipse and Shea is not the like the whole time itself. Eclipse Shea is just like an, or an orchestrator that is like managing resources. And some of those resources is like uh, spinning up a new instance of the VS Code server. Yep. Is that right? Yeah. And I think I think we'll have like some sort of, for every, every remote development environment that gets spun up, we'll have some subset of container setup or whatever that would probably include the VS Code server that's needed for this whole thing to work, um, I think. So th this is still definitely in development. And so we're, we're solving the, we're, we're doing more elaboration and early development on that orchestrating part of it. But the part that we have figured out is, okay, with these parameters, we can use this browser build of VS Code to connect to another machine. Um, obviously, down the line, we'd want these parameters to be hidden from the user. Like, there's no reason the user would need to insert the token. Like, that authentication should be seamless, and even these URLs and stuff. So, like, what what we're iterating on right now is we have some sort of like technical technical demo that we then want to in the spirit of iteration integrate into what's already in the product but behind a feature flag so it's, none of this is going to be generally available but there's there's a lot of desire to get all the integration pieces set up since since they'll need to be that user flow and that integration will still need to exist as these things change. So that's that's the main goal. Does that make sense? Yeah, it makes sense. Okay. Uh, yeah, so um, so this is nice. Uh, and so let's 
start by running this locally on the readme. Here we go. So we can check out the developer docs, um, but even just says we can start by running this example locally. So we're using yarn, um, but we use yarn berry. And Yarn recommends doing this by actually, it includes the version of Yarn in the source control that we use. And so Yarn actually knows to look for that and knows how to um, use this version. So we do have a tool versions. And this is what the ASDF plugin for Yarn says to do is just use Yarn 1 and let Yarn and manage its own release. Because whatever version of Yarn you have globally installed knows to look for local versions of Yarn. Uh, oh, that's amazing. Yeah, so if you run Yarn version, it's going to be grabbing this Yarn, even though this one that's in the repo. Uh, so obviously, when checking out run Yarn install, and this is all using Yarn 2, which does and with the plug and play stuff, so it doesn't have node modules don't pay no attention to this thing i don't that's got to be some artifact from uh, a while ago um but it puts all of its stuff in these in this cache but there's no node modules which is the first weird thing that you will observe with yarn plug and play but the best thing we get with yarn plug and play is all of the um local package references get resolved seamlessly without symlinks because yarn plug and play means that instead of um, node resolving require statements, yarn knows will resolve require statements. So if I have web ID VS code extension here uh, and I can depend on the workspace package web ID EFS or whatever, so everywhere I'm requiring here, GitLab Web IDFS, Yarn knows how to resolve that to this local directory, not using symlinks or anything else like that. So that's one of the best things we get with um, the plug and play system. And so there's the Yarn documentation for all this is really, really good. But basically what they end up, they end up having these ignored files that they generate, which overwrite nodes require, which like can shimmy in how they handle require. So anytime, um, so the reason I bring all this up is there's a lot of out of the box support for Yarn plug and play, but you might run into situations where some sort of development tool or editing environment does not, can't recognize like your plugins and stuff. And a lot of that just means it's trying to use node, raw node, like your global node to install things rather than your local yarn environment. And so one of the most here in our developer docs, uh, let me go to, yeah, so we have, um, da -da 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 -da. oh yeah, yeah, yeah. So like if you're using VS code, you need to tell it to use the workspace version of TypeScript if you're finding like weird errors. Um, because that way it knows how to resolve the things. And so yeah. basically any kind of node command has to go, you either need to run it through yarn node and yarn, that means yarn's gonna shimmy in its require resolution. Or there's a number of other paths based on what you're doing. So if you run into yarn two issues, let me know. Um, so oh, why is this approach better than Simlinks, Paul? Like what was bad about Simlinks? Well, I mean, it's that environment specific and... Uh, well, we, we run on Unix everywhere, right? We don't have any Windows machines. Simlinks work the same on every Linux. It's... Um, the reason the I'm asking is like... The environment specific thing is, is an issue, but it's also like... Having used Learna before, this works mm -hmm. way easier out of the box. Like you don't have to create this. Really? Like you don't have, that was an issue too. It was like, you'd have to, if I did a clean, I'd always have to like tell Learna to do its thing, to recreate the sim links and stuff like that. So it's like, 
from just my experience. I know this has worked way easier for me out of the box, but okay, because uh, like I, I don't have any specific things off the top of my head other than that manual step of creating some links and having multiple node modules all around can cause confusion. Because there's newer tools like the PNPM that they give you like more speed and the deduplication or like you know the single the single node module store and like this this did have some some sharp edges around tooling and like trying to get the linting to work and all of that so i just like this to keep in mind like if there's other things that give us these same benefits but without the drawbacks we should think keep them in mind yeah i don't know if there's any What's most important to me is less that we use Yarn 2 and more important that we have cohesive packages of our code separated. So Yeah, I love the monorepo. Like that's, that's if there's a more of a, thankfully, I think from everything inside of packages isn't necessarily like super coupled to the fact we're using Yarn. So it's like, yeah, if there's a better tooling, um, that's something we could explore. And hopefully, but uh, so yeah. I mean, that's definitely. I'm 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 not going to be close minded to. Uh, to other other mono repo options. Although learn a yeah that 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 project's not even. I could care less. It's just when oh, yeah. it breaks in a certain tool or like the problems we had with ESLint, which was like it took a few days to figure that out. Yeah, that I, it's really. Box. Yes, with all of that, I would just say it's really worth um, reading the, and I think we have it linked to, yeah, let me see. Oh yeah, it's in our FAQ, yes. My VS Code doesn't know how to open plug and play dependencies and I hate Yarn too. Um, uh, let me see. Uh, ba -da -ba -da -ba -da -bum. Oh, yes, 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 yes. Uh, I would just highly recommend read. It's it's worth being familiar with uh, this bit. Um, is it this bit? Yes. Yep, yes, yes, that's yes. good. And this should happen automatically. Like when you, there's, there's a, a yarn uh, script task for this. Yeah, all so all, all of this happens, got right, all of this happens automatically, but it's worth being familiar with what it's actually doing so that when you do run into issues, it's usually the same issue and you could fix it with environment variables or whatever, like if we run into issues, but um, I agree it should work out of the box, but this highly recommend familiarizing if you run into weird issues. Um, and please, Let's yeah, as you said, Chad, let's bubble up those weird issues so that if if this just isn't working for people, we gotta figure something else out. But so far, um it's working for me. Works on my machine. <laughs> <laughs> um I guess I can restart mine. It doesn't work, right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. You just gotta turn it off and on again. Just keep going. Gosh, all right, I gotta rant about this. I have had this MR open for more than a week. And look at all the pipelines. I just keep every day like trying to get the pipeline to be green because it keeps running into weird master broken things. And then when I rebase, I have to, to reset all the approvals. So frustrated. This has been really frustrating. Uh, talking about turning off and on machines. Uh, uh, Paul, um, yeah. how, how do we publish uh, this work? And um, how, uh, how maybe like all of these packaging tools uh, influence in in our deployment? Like, do, you, do we publish like a, an NPM package or are we publishing a, an image, a Docker image? What, yep. what are we doing in that area? So there is, um, going back to the readme, um, there is a packaging script which creates the GitLab Web ID package. So there's really only one main artifact produced from this repository. We don't, we don't publish all of these packages. It's just the web ID package. The other packages are kind of considered internal. Um, 
And so we can create a development. We can um, also create a development package, which basically calls this uh, from a manual job on a pipeline too. So you can create like a local tarball package that way. And there's a published development package that reads the artifacts of this job to actually publish to NPM when, when we when were doing that. And since we're still in early development, everything is just a development package until we get a level of feature complete stability here. Um, and when I show you the way the packages are architected, it'll make sense of what's actually in this main package. So it's good. Okay. Um, so we use Yarn 2. You should just be able to run Yarn install and be able to run Yarn uh, start example. So here's the setup, install Yarn, run Yarn install, Yarn start example. And this is going to create a script that's both serving everything in your packages example dist directory. And that's also watching for changes and will remake everything. So if I make, so I can open this up locally, let's go to here. But now I'm, I'm running the local version of the stuff. Uh, let's not do the um, main GitLab project. We could, it's just needlessly large. Um, if I start this, this all works nicely and that little preview pops up. But let's say I wanna make a change. So this is the main workflow. I'm gonna to go to the, we'll talk about the roles of these packages in a second, but I go to the extension where I'm actually showing that message and I'm saying we're under development. I'll just say, hello world. And this, build script is going to kick off again. And when it's done with this green message of saying, hey, we built everything with a clean exit, then I'm ready to reload here. Uh, we didn't say hello world, probably because good thing we did this because they don't have um, local cache disabled. So on the main product, these all of the assets are going to be scoped under the version of the package we're consuming, but locally they're not scoped. So you might need to keep this open to disable the cache if you're not noticing changes reloading. Now we're hello world. That's great. So now we're we're developing. Um, and that's it. And so we also have unit tests, um, um, which are maybe a little sparse, but they're there. So the the framework of writing tests is there uh, using Jest. So that is nice. Um, these also, we have something, we're using a similar like Jest DOM environment like we do in um, uh, like we do in um, the main GitLab repo, but it's going to way trend down because we don't need everything that the main GitLab repo is doing. So uh, we can write unit tests to get feedback with our changes as well. Um, but yeah, so just run this locally using yarn start example, make changes. You can run yarn tests to run tests. Uh, are, are we following like the same testing philosophy that we're following it up? Or have you thought about introducing some new idea that we haven't adopted at GitLab? Like do we do we write in tests or we formulate some sort of testing pyramid where we have um higher level tests? Higher order tests? Yes. Um yeah, yeah like yeah. integration tests and or top of the way. pyramid. Yeah. Right. So we we have a to-do. Let me go to another good um another good vantage point of the project is going to the issue boards um, and the development board, uh, we have set up integration tests would be really nice. Really wanna do that. And that was one of the reasons too of moving this to its own package because we don't need 
to spin up the whole GitLab backend and everything for just doing some more, even visual integration tests of this repo. Um, so yeah, definitely want to do that. The goal is to get, you know, we should be able to get fairly high coverage. I'd like, I think, feel like every public module. And so now that the fact we even have um, packages, we could have the idea, we don't, but we could have the idea of public and private modules within a package. Every public module definitely needs to have a unit test. Um, and we're not there. So another huge maintenance task is we need to improve our unit test coverage. And, and the fact that we're in our own package, I really think we should take advantage of uh, exploring newer tools like Cypress or Playwright, like things that don't suck like Selenium. <laughs> I love Capybara. I just I want to use Ruby and Capybara is great, but you know, <laughs> under the covers. Like if, yeah. look at look at the VidCon, some of those dem demos of, of the latest Cypress and Playwright. Like they're crazy fast. They don't use Selenium under the covers. They're like use newer technologies. I think we should really look at Selenium's just painful, flaky, like yeah, yeah. And Capybara is Selenium, you know, it's a DSL, but other things have DSLs too. It's just the DSL on top of it. It's the underlying technology. If it's less flicky, that's a win. Yeah. Cypress yeah. also provides like um, uh, a middle layer test framework for components. That's what does? Like not, uh, it provides like Cypress has a components, components testing framework that is not right. like end to end and it's not unit test either. So it's something yeah. like closer to, to the idea of integration test that is faster. And it allows us to like to test a group of components together. Yeah. Isolation without thinking about the entire page. So there, there are many things that we can take advantage of in that, uh, that tool. Yeah, that's awesome. Um, I think it's worth, uh, I think from that comment, it's worth moving to talking about the responsibilities of the different packages. Um, so I just started this MR. I'm, I'm sorry, this hasn't been in the project for a while. It's needed to be, but I finally got to write it out. And unfortunately, it's it's not styled really nicely um, by GitLab's mermaid thing. But I'm going to try to use this to um, talk about what's happening here. So these big outer boxes are these packages. And the gray boxes inside are key artifacts of the packages. So the main package is this web ID package. That's the main package we publish. And there's main, mainly just two, you can think of just two big parts to this. There's one, which is the big index.js that when we say, hey, from the main GitLab repo, I want to import at GitLab slash web ID, this is what we get. And it has the start function. But what we get also with this package is are a whole bunch of assets that we need to self-host. And so we do this with web other Webpack packages that have bits that we run at runtime and like bits that have scripts that we have to pull in or iframes or whatever that we have to pull in that we self-host with Webpack. And so um, there's an there is a this public directory and this web ID package, which these aren't imported at runtime, these are just self-hosted. Uh, and so this includes a main JS, which is the- Wait, I mean, uh, before we move on there, I'm not completely understanding the difference between self-hosted and imported on runtime. Like when you are running on a, a JavaScript application in the web browser, Everything is imported on runtime, right? So what what do you mean by self-hosting? What do you mean by importing on runtime? This is a really good question. So let's look at the main entry point here, which is the Git is the web ID package in our index file here. So we have these um, this method. These are our main entry point methods. We start or we can start remote. These kind of so then, you know, they call this base method of starting based on any config you have, we're gonna start. Um, and what we do here is we create an iframe and we load in all of, from this iframe, 
we get the specific iframe HTML that's um, needed. And you see from this iframe HTML, we have a whole bunch of scripts that we can't, we have to treat this like a document, like a separate document. And so these come from the VS code, the raw VS code built, like our CSS that we have to import and the other like um, the workbench, main workbench scripts, which add all the VS code globals and things. So uh, instead of raw importing these, because we kind of need to spin up this containerized environment and the way these scripts are built is this is, this is that browser runtime level of like, we're not, we're not, um, all these scripts are like writing to the document and things like that. Uh, so these scripts are things that we can't just import from here, they're self-hosted. And so we have to reference them somewhere. And so that's the main difference here is we have our main, if I look at the package JSON, the main comes from libindex.js, but dist contains, this is how we bootstrap all of the VS code stuff. And then here's all the self-hosted VS code stuff that we need to host as well, which can, contains all of the extension code. And so all of these, the way VS code works is, it all, and also the way VS Code works, instead of using, um, so let me go to this project. Um, so the VS Code Bootstrap, its main output is this main JS thing, which is this is the this is the main script that that iframe that we create runs. But what it does is it loads all of these um, VS Code. Uh, scripts. And VS Code uses AMD to import scripts. And so it, it expects these to be self-hosted scripts. AMD um, doesn't bundle things. It, it's looking for, when I say, when I use uh, the keyword require, so going to the start thing here, um, yeah, it's, it's, it's looking for this AMD module uh, a interface to define new modules based on other modules that you're requiring. And it's going to fetch these from the, um, from the self-hosted scripts. So part of okay, this is so an artifact of how VS Code works, of uh, VS Code is expecting all of its infrastructure to be self-hosted. And so we're, we're creating a bootstrapper that will also need to be self-hosted, which knows how to reference all that stuff. Okay, so trying to recap, we have lib, lib slash index. That is the code that we, are, that we are writing, that we are gonna import through the, in the that we are gonna import in the GitLab, in the GitLab application using, the module system that is used by GitLab, that is Webpack. Yep. And we are gonna 100%. like, we are gonna do all the the build system stuff we do in GitLab with that file. Then everything that is in this slash public is using its own mod module system that is AMD, and we are publishing all of that directly without any pre pre preprocessing uh, yep. performed by Webpack. So this is something 100%. like. We, we can imagine that as a, an application that everything that is in this slash public, like something, an application that is already built and ready to be put in that, and ready to be deployed in a, in an static, uh, like in a, in a CDN, something that is hosting static files. And we're just like importing that I, that I, all of those files through the iframe and that lib slash index is created. Yep. 100%. Yep. Okay. So yeah. Webpack, Babel, nothing touches these files. These are completely raw static HTML or files that we need to serve through HTTP. And 
this main job is just bootstrapping the iframe that loads all that stuff. So the the part where I got lost is like the the CDN, like the even the self-hosted stuff, those files still live in the in the package, you know, the web IDE package that Webpack is mm -hmm. pulling down, right? They're all one big bundle. Yeah, and, and this is where Webpack is Webpack Which is lives on NPMJS or or the ca caching proxy or whatever, right? Not necessarily. And this is like where Webpack is a little sophisticated. So it's like you're able to say, oh, that's nothing. Like <laughs> um so we have uh yeah, so check this out. We're this is where this gets set up in our web pack. Okay. Where we say from this node modules path, we're gonna copy everything to this output path. And that output path, let me see if I can find that. Um, da, 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 da. oh yeah, 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 yeah. So this isn't actually main, this is actually physically copying it. It's saying that anytime Webpack receives this request of wherever we output all of our web, yes, 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 yes. So rap, we basically tell Webpack, skip processing anything here. Just copy all of these over to your assets. And so then we're able to then add this, the public path of where these assets will live can get injected in our source code. So it's just hosted as a static file like HTML or anything else under the public directory of Rails. Okay. Yes. Yeah. And so then we pass along to our main entry point. Here's the base URL where everything's hosted. I, I use it, by the way, Shad, I used the, the term CDN incorrectly. I, what, what, what I meant was like, what if, like we put all of those files in, in the server, any, in any ways, like in any place where we are deploying the JavaScript files uh, to be used by the application. It, it could be a CDN, but it could be like yeah, right. any other type of, of a strategy. It's yep. whatever is under the public directory, which maybe probably is under a CDN in a production environment. <laughs> yep. Yeah. And it, and it is. And so we do the same thing with Sourcegraph. Sourcegraph needs to be something really similar. So this is the same approach for. Uh, um, and so, like the. Obviously, that means like it's not subject to tree shaking or anything like that that Webpack is doing. It's just like these files are never touched, they're always copied exactly as they are. Yeah, and it's and it's not like we want them to like they're supposed right. to be like it would break VS Code if it did. A hundred percent. Yep. Um, yeah. So that's a good question. Um, and so yes, this main module that we import from the main GitLab project is really slim, and it's just hey, we're just gonna start the iframe. The majority of everything you see is actually self-host stuff. So like starting at the right hand side, like so we get all of VS Code assets from this package VS code build. And so this package just has a um, script in it for how do we um, download what our main base VS code version that we're using. And so there's actually a checked in file VS code version, which links to one of our VS code fork releases and source control. But you can also, there's, if you, in the developer docs, there's a way to get this to link into your local file system. If I'm needing to work on both the fork and this at the same time, um, you can have it linked to a local file system. But the main output of all of this is just this VS code directory, which is all, which is not any code that, some minor changes we've made from the fork perspective, but it's just a build of VS Code for the browser. Um, and the, 
the, the one thing to understand there, I don't know if I'm I'm jumping ahead to something you're gonna say. Where it's like that's the VS Code server build, not to be confused with the client build of which this project is is well this is a client yes yeah, so this well so this is the client build so that's where like and this project this project consumes and this is right. client build yes even i'm getting confused it's good i'm i'm bringing it up yeah no that's a good but that's a good i learn it and then i forget it and then i learn it and then i forget it <laughs> well maybe that's maybe that's a some sort of smell or something I don't it's know. the client and the server what we're pulling down wait a minute from, that, from this I, perspective I it's just the because... client well what yeah. we yeah. I, I'm a bit confused with that because when, when you mean that we are we have the client and this server in the same package by server do you mean the same VS Code server that we were talking about previously? Yes, but they're in separate packages. So it's actually we have one fork of their repo. Right. We produce multiple artifacts. We'll we'll produce a server artifact and we produce a client artifact. This is only consuming this the client artifact, yeah. okay. but the code base that the project, this fork project that generated that client release is the same project that is the server that's going to get run in the remote development infrastructure yeah. but are, in the form we, of a different client uh, package. <laughs> are we, are we, um, let's say that we are like, um, are, are we, uh, implementing or submitting changes to this fork? Are we changing the fork? Um, we try not to. We've had to for some small things. And we definitely needed to to like remove all the tel telemetry stuff. Um, ah. But in general, we try not to. Are we, when we, when we need to deploy a new version of the VS Code server, do we depend on, on this same GitLab Web ID project to manage um, everything related to the VS Code server version that we are deploying as well? That's a good question, and I don't think so. This is client only. So far, the whole scope of this is just client only. Yeah, all of the version and the fork and the, the publishing, all of that lives in that separate v GitLab VS web id vs code fork project yeah so that's a that is a separate project web id vs code fork which is a fork with some of our own commits of vs code yeah uh yeah um so this is actually like one of the one of the it might be one of the weirder packages because it's not a JavaScript package, but it's definitely one of the simpler packages because it does something really straightforward of it just pulls from that metadata that's committed to source control, the VS Code release that ends up in the web ID dist public. Um, the other more significant thing is we then add our own extension has to live alongside the other built-in extensions of within VS Code. And so we have a web ID VS Code extension package, which is main output is this main JS. And this, this is very important VS Code extension metadata package JSON. Um, these are the main outputs there. And that's where a lot of the code that you for the main issue is that you're gonna write is gonna live. So VS Code has a whole really sophisticated extension API. And the only way we get to interact with that API is within extension land. So I can't I can't easily like create a modal to show up from my bootstrap package because I'm just not, I don't have any, any of that internal VS Code API exposed to me there. The only way that gets ex exposed is through this extension that this is our main engine built-in extension thing. Um, and so to get the file system working, um, you see that on the, we have one big entry point that gets bundled using ES build. Um, give me one quick second. What's up, little girl? Oh, little girl, I know you're not sick, but maybe we have popsicle sugar, okay? We'll see. I'll go check your temperature. 
<laughs> Sorry. She's not sick. <laughs> um, so this is one big build of like, so if you look at the source files, there's a whole lot of stuff going on here. So we have um, some VS code implementations of VS code interfaces here. We have a main entry point method, but we use ES build to bundle all of this into one file. That's this is the extension that's going to run. So whenever the, the way the VS code extensions work is it has to be a module that exports and activate and exports a deactivate um, function. Um, since we don't really allow any deactivating of this, we kind of really only have an activate. And that's where we get to do our API methods like showing the warning message. And um, we have a whole bunch of process for creating our file systems and stuff like that. So this is where a lot of the glue code of our in-memory file system and VS Code's API will come together. And the same thing with the source control. This is the glue code for that stuff. Um, does that make sense? Completely makes sense, yeah. Okay. So what I love about separating these packages is now to just solve the file system problem, that's its own package. And we have tests for that, which are just focused on you know, a file list. Nothing VS Code is in here. This is just about creating an in-memory file system that we can use to manage source control and... Um, it's, it's loosely coupled and highly cohesive, right, Paul? Those are really <laughs> good adjectives. Wow, I think I'm going to start using them. <laughs> How like then like um this web web IDE uh, file system package all of this is business logic um like when when we want to to create a, a presentation layer uh for the file system like we do all of the presentation layer in the web IDE VS Code extension right mm -hmm. yeah yeah okay. so what would be really cool I, but in this case like the 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 file extension is like it has no UI. Like its sole purpose is to fulfill how VS Code wants to work with an underlying file system implementation, right? Yeah, it, but it is decoupled. So it's like, so here we do have um, file system provider takes mm. in. This is a VS. This is in the VS Code extension. This implements a very specific VS Code interface file system provider but you see that it takes in. So this is actually an adapter pattern. It takes in our own file system interface. So we really want to decouple what does it mean to be a file system from what does VS Code say it means to be a file system. And there's a whole bunch of wins there of one, just keeping it simple, but also I could see us reusing these, these um, modules for things like snippets and down the line. Like this, these are problems we shouldn't have to resolve. And hopefully we we can solve that problem cohesively in a reusable way. Uh, so this uses browser FS under the hood too. Um, so that's how the file system gets implemented. But we have our abstract interface for this is the, these are the methods we need from a file system. Uh, yeah. The other weird, this is, this is probably the other weird package is so we need a file system, but we also need to communicate with the GitLab API. And um, inside extension land, so these are all notes I'm going to write into this document too, but right now we just have the diagram. Inside extension land, VS Code is really nice and gives us a lot of really great methods to use, but we are in a sandbox and we cannot make any fetch requests or anything writing to the document. It has a um, fairly comprehensive module to make sure extensions stay in their place for securities, for security reasons. So the only way for an ex from an extension to like break out of that sandbox is through commands. So when we bootstrap everything, we can actually give VS Code a set of predefined commands. And when we're bootstrapping everything, we are inside the iframe context. So we can make web requests. We can do all that stuff. So 
this VS Code Bootstrap uses this package called, there's probably a much better name for this, but it's mediator commands. It's about, these are the commands that are needed to mediate outside of the extension context. And so these commands include things like, uh, uh, let's open it up. These commands include things where we, we start everything by like fetching the tree and the project branch and stuff like that. And it includes fetching the raw file content that we have to do over an API. And um, finally, this like, we're ready. We, we loaded everything. So if we needed to show, we needed the, the git let main git lab project to show some sort of like spinner, then we would know when to show this stuff when it's all said and done and finished. So any of this like things that need a side effect that communicate outside of the extension sandbox, these, these, the way, the only means of doing this is with these commands. And so these are all cohesively live inside mediator commands. And this is really the only consumer of the GitLab API client. Uh, which is the GitLab API client just makes API calls. So that's that's all that's happening there. And when we like when we did the stack blitz spike to show the whole stack blitz editor and terminal everything in an editor pane, that was was a new command or it was just added onto one of the existing commands. I think that was in the extension command. So it's like for right. those. So the extension, um, and so it's worth familiarizing with the VS Code extension API. Um, there's there's a whole bunch of documentation. I can try to crash course another time, or if you want to um, maybe in the developer guide, highlighting specific parts that are very relevant would be helpful. But in our package JSON that VS Code reads, we have to declare everything that we're going to contribute here, which would be like a commit command or in our case, in the issues of opening the remote development, we had like a open remote development command that, that we'll need. But all of this isn't happening to leave the extension sandbox. So this, this can just all live here. And you can read, you declare them in this package JSON, and then you register them when you actually activate uh, the extension. And that's it. That's all that's happening. Um, the API client is just a thin wrapper around the the REST API. Yeah. Whatever. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I see. It's like it's it's very very intuitive to understand. Um, I think that the idea of having a, a mediator command to talk to the outer world, it's um, yeah, it's, it's really cool. It's like it's uh, it's really well designed. Um. By the way, uh, Chad Paul, I need to step out because I have another meeting in five minutes. Um, so thank you so much for uh, for this introduction. And I don't know, like maybe the next step for me is um, is really more about uh, yes, plug and play. Uh, maybe if you can share with me some links uh, to the. Uh, to the documentation about VS Code API, yeah, the ones that are very relevant to me, I have to read about that. And what I think that I missed, like I really like to know more about, is about the feature that we are working on this milestone. Suddenly, like we, we didn't have time to talk about that. Uh, yeah, do, yeah. Like, could we? Do you have time to meet tomorrow? Yeah, we have another pairing time tomorrow. I think it's. 30 minutes earlier than this one was. So we can pick up a conversation then. I think it's on our editor calendar too. Cool. That works for me. Cool. Yeah, let's plan on it. And yeah, we can we can deep dive and maybe even just pair a little bit on, on this issue. Um, so a great place to start would be getting the example running and then maybe applying this, applying this patch. And what you'll see is from the screenshot the terminal then is given this like welcome view and an action happens when you click that button. And so um, we'll get to, I think then reading the high level flow is kind of how we expect it to behave. 
Sounds good. Well, this was a really good introduction, Paul. So thanks again for that. Um, yeah. Uh, see you tomorrow then. Yeah. Thanks. Thanks, John. Thanks, Enrique. Yeah. Good job uh, on the diagram and, and writing out some of this plan. Thanks. I'll ping you today to probably merge that architecture doc in. So. Okay. Bye. See you. Bye. Bye.